and welcome to My Security TV and our first episode for 2021. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm with My Security Media in the editorial role. And today we're looking at the ISACA blockchain uh, framework and guidance. Uh, we've got Ron Coranta, the chairman and CEO with the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance. Uh, he's in New York and Dustin Brewer, principal futurist with ISACA. And Dustin, I believe, is in Melbourne, Florida, not Melbourne, Australia. So I will have them on very shortly. Um, as we do on My Security TV, we cover aerospace and space, defence and national security, cybersecurity and critical technology, and cities and infrastructure. Let me bring in uh, Ron Quaranta there in New York and Dustin Brewer. Uh, you are in Melbourne, Florida, right, Dustin? I am. No, not Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne, Florida. That's right. Nice. It's the lesser okay. known of the two Melbournes. Well, at least you say it the right way. You didn't come up with some obscure way to say Melbourne. Uh, <laughs> and Ron, um, there's a slight delay uh, with Ron. So maybe about 10 seconds. Uh, but uh, it's uh, he's still up with us. So you got us there, Ron, OK? I do. Right. Thanks for having me, Chris. <laughs> Good work. Now, I've also got some slides. Uh, let me just bring up the chat. So we've got a few people uh, watching and listening. Welcome to say hello. And particularly also, if you've got any blockchain related projects, I'd be interested to know where we sit uh, in terms of that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up at least that slide so we're talking to it. Uh, and that's a generic blockchain reference architecture model. So Maybe I might hand over to Ron. You're the lead author for this particular framework and guidance uh, report, for want of a better term. But it's quite a you know uh, in-depth um, bit of work with a lot of contributing authors. Maybe just the background to introducing this framework. It's the first one for ISACA, probably the first one I've, I've come across in terms of an official association like ISACA releasing a framework uh, and guidance. Yeah, just uh, the background to your role uh, and the work that you're doing and, and your lead author uh, contribution to this report. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Chris. And again, thank you for, for having me. Uh, a little very brief uh, bit about my biography. Uh, I come out of financial services and financial technology. Um, I've spent quite a few years in, in global exchanges and global markets. The Wall Street Blockchain Alliance, we really work to help our members across different industries understand the impact of blockchain uh, and one of the common questions we had repeatedly was what does this mean for our enterprise what's the what's the guidelines or what are the guidelines or the framework around how this makes sense how do we incorporate this into what our enterprises do uh, and we had the opportunity uh, working with Dustin which is who's, who's a dear friend and it was a privilege uh, with ISACA to help the formation of a blockchain framework for enterprises the reference guide around how it how it impacts their business, how it impacts their industry, and the risks and concerns they need to have as part of that implementation. Okay, and how many? How did you get the sort of authors? Who who was kind of putting all of that together in terms of just selecting who was going to contribute to this? Because there's a great, uh, very broad skill set involved. Yeah. So no, Dustin and the ISACA team, and I'll, I'll defer to Dustin uh, after my comment. Really uh, did give us a lot of give me personally a lot of free, free um, a lot of leeway from an authorship perspective to pull in colleagues in technology um, in enterprise and really kind of broad experience that allowed um, them to bring their expertise and experience to focus on the challenges of a blockchain implementation. Dustin, you you know several of the authors as well. Uh, it'd be good to hear your input there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, of course, Ron and myself uh, were working together on some other projects, um, specifically with the AICPA. So there is actually a paper that's going to come out on blockchain risk specifically um, here uh, in the next couple of months. So keep an eye out for that as well. Um, uh, and that's where Ron and I met. And we actually pulled in a couple more people from there. Uh, Ron Brennan was one of those, uh, uh, Rod Brennan was one of those uh, uh, people that we kind of pulled in from the AICPA as well. And then um, we have uh, a, a couple of members who, uh, who, who uh, from ISACA, one member specifically, it's one fan who actually did a really good presentation on blockchain technology, just the, the technology itself and kind of how it works at one of our ISACA conferences last year. Uh, I'm sorry, two years ago. Uh, the years are all are all kind of pushed together nowadays, but uh, uh, it was two years ago. But um, so we we tagged him for it, and uh, and you know I'm sure we'll get to it uh, in a little bit here when we get when we dive into the the framework a little bit more. But uh, he really was kind of key to writing more the, some of those more technical aspects of the ISACA blockchain framework. 
So maybe maybe if you could, uh, Dustin, just introduce us to the the architecture here. Um, is this pretty much what we're looking at as the the sort of the main architectural model of how blockchain is working? And maybe just talk to to this if you can. Absolutely. So this is uh, more of a breakdown of, uh, and, and this is uh, borrowed, of course, from uh, from another uh, source. But uh, uh, this uh, this particular um, uh, image is actually uh, showing. I believe it's in. Uh, I'm trying to remember which section it's in now. That it's you, in uh, four. <laughs> you show, it's in four, uh, which is why oh, I pulled up here. Um, yeah, the generic blockchain reference architecture. So this is kind of just breaking down the idea of of the of you know what blockchain is uh, for the reader. Um, we tried to do somewhat of a um, a curved approach to introducing the reader to not only uh, you know what what we can do once we implement a blockchain, but also what a blockchain actually is and what we can use it for. Um, you know, it's it's almost impossible to talk about blockchain without talking about Bitcoin or any cryptocurrencies because they are kind of what pushed it to the forefront of everybody's mind um, and actually made it. But it's it's being utilized for so many different aspects of um, uh, uh, of, of of so many different um, uh, industries that, uh, you know, it's it, it's actually it, it's one of those technologies that it started off as one thing and it's kind of just, you know, kind of breaking into so many other uh, facets from, you know, healthcare to um, uh, supply chain and, and, and so on and so forth. You can really apply it to anything. Um, so uh, this particular image was something that uh, as you go through and read it, this is kind of, you know, it looks, when you see it, it's really kind of like, whoa, that's, there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, yeah. And we break it down in the framework itself. Um, but- um, Well, that, that uh, was a question I had of yeah. how complicated do you think this technology is for anyone who sort of hasn't looked at it in depth, and again, I come in from maybe a information systems auditor uh, perspective, or if you're a technology manager for an enterprise, and they're like, "Why haven't we looked at blockchain?" I mean, a lot of enterprises have been looking at blockchain, but I don't hear too many case studies coming through. It's still often, you know, a uh, sort of a target team is set aside in an enterprise to look at the opportunities. Um, but you know, again, I'm not seeing a lot of firm case studies that are being announced or released. Um, where, where would you say it's in the market and how complicated or what are some of the barriers to it? Is it still computing power and a bit of cost or even skill sets required? I'll actually defer to Ron on this. Go Ron if you can. Yeah, I can. And again, apologies for a little bit of the internet problem here. Um, from what I did hear of the question, I mean, you know, Dustin referenced some of these industries. When we started this journey and I've been involved in the crypto and blockchain spaces since 2012, late 20. 12, early 2013, it really started um, in financial markets and, and trying to and understand what financial markets can do to do things like streamline clearing and settlement, leveraging, um, and it absolutely has expanded to Dustin's point. In the healthcare space, um, you know, the Walmart example is something Dustin and I have spoken about many times from the su supply chain perspective. And I think from a skill set perspective, there really are two very important things um, that we always advise enterprise members to give some thought to. One is at the technology level, what are you doing to educate your technology team to really keep up with some of the developments in the technology? That core understanding, what do we, we mean when we say blockchain versus distributed ledger technology? And how do we do what we do in the enterprise and how that might be reinvented uh, in the context of blockchain? And Chris, I think the other thing that's important to raise there as well is really this understanding for far too many technologists and they're all brilliant, but every enterprise that's looking at blockchain needs to ask themselves the fundamental question of what does this blockchain solve for us? What could we use it for? Because there will be instances, and Justin, you and I have had this conversation many times where it might not make sense. Um, but I think more critically, what problem are you trying to solve by potentially putting forward blockchain as a solution? Well, that's something I've heard before. Obviously, we've covered blockchain in the past, but it has been that of, are you saving any money by doing this? Is it a better process? You know, is it speeding it up? Uh, I've always come at, from it. It obviously has that governance and somewhat uh, sort of that known ledger, that, that proof uh, in terms of that supply chain. But is that absolutely necessary in all cases as well? Um, Dustin, where, how disruptive is blockchain going to be or do you think it's going to remain in a very specialised 
sort of set of industries and for very specialized purposes? You know, I think uh, we see how disruptive it is right now. Obviously, again, I know we're not supposed to talk too much about cryptocurrency, but with uh, Bitcoin uh, now at, uh, you know, barreling over $40,000 per coin. Um, and, and that's really what kind of gets people thinking about that. And then the underlying technology of blockchain, which is what's driving it, right? Um, the, the examples that um, Ron and myself have kind of mentioned here, where we talk about healthcare, we talk about um, uh, you know, supply chain, um, and, you know, it, Blockchain is really designed to kind of solve, you know, to kind of go into cybersecurity here a little bit. When we talk about the CIA triad, it's really there to kind of solve the integrity side of the house, right? It does some other things as well. It can even do confidentiality, which we kind of see, um, uh, you know, coming out of uh, uh, cryptocurrencies as well. Um, But uh, it's really there for the integrity aspect of data, making sure that the data that we're seeing uh, in this chain or uh, in this database or wherever we're looking at it is the data that was originally put in there. Um, and if anybody goes in and changes anything in there, then we record that as well. Um, you know, that's kind of where we see it really coming into play for uh, industries such as healthcare, right? So if a patient is put into a blockchain uh, system from, you know, stepping through the doors of the hospital all the way through all of their, um, you know, their their medical journey of whatever they're doing, uh, and and making sure that they're recording, you know, all uh, all procedures, all drugs, all you know, uh, anything else that they're that they're kind of doing, uh, you know, there's there's a, a better chance and there's more integrity to that data. Um, as far as its disruption levels, uh, again, we're seeing it so much right now in the financial markets. Uh, I don't really see it being. Um, uh, not being disruptive in too many markets. If it if if someone finds a viable, like uh, Ron was saying, if someone finds a truly viable use for it in that market. Um, but uh, as you as you've noticed, uh, cybersecurity is just uh, exploding right now as uh, um, uh, uh, as an industry. Um, we're trying to find these. Uh, I don't want to say quick and easy ways, but we're trying to find the, the cheapest and most effective ways in order to uh, to complete that CIA triad, right? Uh, and and blockchain, although it is, uh, it can get very very intricate in some aspects. Uh, it still is a very uh, simple kind of simplistic idea of the technology. I mean, you take data, you hash it, you take that hash, you put it in the next block of data, you hash that, and so on and so forth. Um, so it still um, comes down. I mean, what about the power issues in terms of running the blockchain? Has that been solved or getting better? So when we, uh, you know, most of the power issues are going to come from something like uh, a Bitcoin or a, a non, uh, I'm sorry, a, a non-centralized blockchain style, uh, where you know you have to have these really advanced mathematical problems that are solved by somebody's GPU somewhere, right? Or somebody's CPU somewhere um, uh, in order to, you know, kind of prove that that person, you know, it's it's proof of work, right? Um, So um, we see that a lot more, I'd say, in the financial side of the house. If we're talking about private blockchain and all we really need to do is hash something, uh, you know, that's, we we do that all the time in cybersecurity, right? We hash uh, files all the time. It does kind of take a long time depending on the size of the file, you know, as they get bigger, yes, it's going to take more processing power. Um, And, uh, uh, you know, as as far as solving that problem, um, you know, the the faster processors obviously are are something that's going to help out. Quantum eventually when it comes around, you know, will we'll just completely, you know, change everything. But of course, that will be another thing. Well, that's that interesting because you, you saw we're going to be covering quantum in a couple of weeks uh, mm-hmm. and semiconductors. Is that something else that will allow blockchain uh, to be more disruptive, I suppose, if, if for want of a better word, or sort of more wider application in terms of the computing power? And just knowing Ron's in and in and out here, so Ron, we're going to stay with you. I don't know what's going on, but stay with us, mate. Don't go anywhere, but keep going, uh, Dustin. Okay, yeah. I think um, uh, you know when quantum comes out, the disruptor will be quantum. Like that, that's yeah, just going to yeah, cool. blow everything else out of the water. Now, with that being said, you know we do have people, and we've uh, Ron's actually been part of uh, of the Emerging Technologies Advisory Group we have at ISACA, and uh, you know on that on that board we kind of talk about things like we we pontificate about things like this, and like, hey, what happens to blockchain when quantum comes along? And the the really short answer is that then we have quantum blockchain. 
right? right? Then we have the quantum computers creating these hashes. And of course, it's going to do it in a millisecond as opposed to, you know, 10, 10 minutes or however long a, uh, a, I don't even know how long a, a Bitcoin blockchain takes to solve, a blockchain takes to solve these days, but um, um, it'll just be instantaneous and it, uh, it'll be another thing. And the, the need for blockchain, I think will still be there. I understand that quantum computing is going to change so many things about how we think about encryption and how we think about, um, uh, you know, the CIA tried out a load, um, but I, I, you know, it's going to come with its own kind of um, uh, its own issues that we need to help solve. Maybe a question from an enterprise perspective. So if an enterprise is looking at this or they have looked at it, but they haven't ad adopted it, what should they be doing? Uh, and, and again, from an ISACA, even a member's perspective, other than picking up a document like this, and again, uh, you know, it's pretty expansive. There's, uh, I think there's eight or nine key chapters and it really does dive into the the architecture of it as well is this where is was this the intention of of this from a framework and guidance perspective of this is your starting point read it and see where it applies to you and and the work that you're doing and maybe ron uh from that perspective and again also outside of the financial sector you know again you mentioned supply chains uh, Dustin, you mentioned healthcare, and my first thought was these global vaccines that are getting distributed around the world. If they're not using blockchain, why aren't they using blockchain? Maybe we'll finish with that question, Ron. Um, in terms of the application of blockchain, you can hear us, okay? Okay, Dustin, can you okay. maybe take that on in terms of the vaccines and sure uh, as well. Um and, and that's a difficult question to answer uh, because I don't, I'm not privy to how, uh, you know, in the States, uh, Pfizer or Madeira is, are, are the, how they're kind of handling that uh, supply chain. Um, they could be using blockchain, we don't know. Yeah. Um, but uh, as to why, you know, they kind of wouldn't implement that uh, it is because blockchain is, is a, it's still an emerging technology. It still is one of those, you know, uh, Everybody's kind of skeptical about it because of how it kind of got it into its popularity. And I know we're not supposed to talk about financial stuff, but that is how it's got how it's gotten yeah. popularity, right? Some people, you know, we have, uh, you know, uh, people who are who have been in the industry, who have been in the financial industry for decades, saying that it's, uh, you know, it's not really um, uh, a viable. Ad. It's a it's a sham, and it's not really a thing. Uh, and at the end of the day, none of that matters. Bringing it back to other uh, other industries, then. Um, you know, it, it still is, it still has that shadow kind of hanging over it of, you know, this was kind of introduced, uh, I mean, blockchain, you know, as we know, it has been around since 2008, 2009. Yeah. Uh, but even before that, we're talking about, you know, late 90s, uh, where the first kind of ideas of blockchain or the first ideas of kind of having this this uh, distributed, you know, decentralized ledger um, that, that, that was, uh, that had integrity within its data, um, you know, it, it, it it's 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 still this evolving thing, and you have places like uh, IBM. Uh, you have places that are trying to implement these things. Uh, Hyperledger is something that we talk about a lot in our blockchain framework. It's an open source um, uh, 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 software that can actually allow you to write your own smart contracts and you know create your own blockchain and create your own digital assets um, on your network as you want it. So um, I think with more support from more open source things like that. Um, you know, I, I, I can I can definitely see it uh, kind of, um, you know, starting to uh, break the, you know, break into a lot more industries and people being able to accept it a little bit better. Ron, uh, I don't know if you can hear us, but if you could, uh, do you have anything to add to what I was saying? Fingers crossed. Uh, on the assumption, even a piece of what you said uh, from an enterprise adoption perspective, uh, a couple of things. And by the way, Dustin, uh, it is 10 minutes for a Bitcoin blockchain uh, programmatically. But I'll double check the questions that are, are really interesting when we have these enterprise conversations. Um, and again, I know, Dustin, we've said it before, getting away from financial markets. Chris, one of the things I would suggest at the enterprise level, and, and we've had the pri privilege of having this conversation. Again, we mentioned supply chain, um, digital media, interestingly enough, and things like tracking royalties and digital media rights, tracking of IP. Uh, I think, Chris, you had mentioned healthcare previously. Uh, both from the tracking of vaccinations as well as the provenance of drugs. Uh, the other thing I'll add to that is the mess that is global healthcare records, which you might have touched on. 
uh, a, br- a bit briefly. Uh, you know, elderly members of my family, if they have four or five different doctors, they have at least four or five different identities. And the the work that we're seeing a lot of uh, underlying all of these enterprise conversations is really an, almost an identity discussion. How do we yeah. track and manage identity between different entities, different organizations, individual people? And I would argue, and I think you, you put this in the agenda, Chris, um, one of the deepest, most important conversations there is governance. Uh, in a world where we can operate in a more decentralized way, what does it mean if, Chris, you can own your own medical records and decide who has access to that data? And, um, you know, Dustin, it's a conversation we have a lot as well, in the past at least, the UX discussion. What does that UX look like? Yeah. We've never had the power individually to manage these these the, these data sets. How do we invent, reinvent how we do what we do because of that? Maybe let's look at the, the security because you just mentioned governance and from an auditing perspective, how much insights are you going to get from an auditing perspective or how do you test that governance? Uh, where do you start in looking at that? And then there's for the first question that I did have, and this is taken from part seven of the report, well, guidance uh, is what are the different attacks on blockchains and how can they be mitigated? So, you know, we do hear a lot of the um, sort of attacks on the cryptocurrencies and the theft of cryptocurrencies and the compromise of wallets and the like. Um, maybe just let's sort of focus a little bit on the governance and the security aspect first. Maybe governance first. Um, where are the strengths there? How do you? What, how much insight do you get into the governance of a blockchain? Um, you know, from a governance perspective, again, the idea here with blockchain is that we have this um, uh, we have this kind of self auditing, self governed entity that's utilized to uh, collect and disseminate data. Um, so, what really needs to be governed about it, or what, what, you know, what kind of special things kind of apply to this? Um, you know, as much as you can say, hey, my system's the best. Uh, all of my data is safe. Uh, it's it's uh, it's tokenized, so it's privatized. It's going. Uh, you can you can say that all day long to any federal regulator in the United States you want to. They're not going to believe you unless you go through an audit, right? right. Uh, or at least an IT audit, um, you know, for those systems. So that's kind of where we see, um, you know, the the space where it was kind of being ignored, which is kind of why we started this whole thing to begin with. Um, you know, you have a technology that's supposed to kind of solve this shit, this issue, but at the same time. It's not, you know, it, it still is part of a, of, a, of a computer system, and those computer systems still need something, uh, you know, that, to make sure that they're being monitored and to make sure that, that they're following the proper um, uh, regulations. Uh, maybe the attack scenarios around blockchain and, yeah, how do you mitigate against sort of a, a, you still have the, the issues of cybersecurity to contend with? Absolutely. Going going on what I was saying about, you know, hey, this is a technology and it's supposed to solve somewhat of a cybersecurity issue. It still is based upon, um, you know, our our traditional infrastructure for for computing. Right. Uh, the same kind of computing infrastructure we've had, at least since the 70s. Um, and so uh, with that, of course, it's going to bring its own uh, its own issues as soon as you implement the system. Um, so we kind of broke it up in the framework into as far as the attacks go uh, into infrastructure network level. Uh, node level, smart contracts, and user level, and uh, those are just kind of the uh, uh, the the top layer kind of attacks. And I think we go into over 20 attacks, uh, specific attacks for blockchain yeah. uh, for blockchain. So um, uh, when it comes to infrastructure and network, uh, I mean that's that's kind of self, I don't want to say it's self-explanatory, but it is one of those things that we've been dealing with so far, for so long in cybersecurity. It's kind of the first you know the first line of defense that we go for. Um, that, uh, you know, it, it's very similar. We have actually within the framework, we have a control section that actually will uh, take you through and, uh, you know, talk about the different specific controls to a blockchain that are maybe might be uh, need to be tweaked a little bit from your traditional infrastructure. Um, node level stuff. So like crypto jacking uh, is one of the more um, uh, prominent kind of, uh, you know, in the news kind of attacks that's, that's happening there. And how do you mitigate that? Um, you know, it, it's malware, right? So uh, anti-malware, uh, you know, and all of these things kind of boil back down to, you know, one of the one of the big things in cybersecurity as well, which is defense in depth. Um, making sure that, you know, we, we've hit infrastructure, now we're at the node level, then we move on to smart contracts. Now, smart contracts are programs. They're they're literally programs. Now, they can be super short, they can be super long. Either way, 
still going into um, you know smart contracts uh, with the mindset of uh, secure DevOps, making sure that you're looking at uh, the code, making sure that somebody else is looking at the code, doing a SAS, doing a DAS, doing you know a, a, a static and dynamic uh, code analysis. Uh, these are all things that are in practice with. Uh, secure DevOps that we need to make sure that we're also doing with smart contracts because just because it's a new technology doesn't mean that it's it's completely not you know susceptible to any kind of the old attacks and actually in the framework uh, again this was written by this part actually specifically was written by Tuan Fan um, who uh, who is you know definitely techni a technically minded person he actually shows you the code snippets and shows you that like hey if you just switch these two things around these two lines of code right here that completely stops you know this attack from being possible at all. So, uh, you know, that's the smart contract layer. And then, of course, we have the user level. Uh, and this is, you know, the, uh, uh, the weakest link in any computer network is, of course, us, right? The human beings, we're, we're terrible. We're, <laughs> we're susceptible to social engineering attacks. We're susceptible to clicking on links we're not supposed to. We're susceptible to doing all these things. And so, uh, again, this is just, it, it's, it's kind of going through the defense in depth again, but making sure that we're, um, uh, we're, we're focusing specifically on the blockchain system and making sure that we're including that, even though it is technically a cybersecurity tool, it's something that we have that, uh, it's something that we're also continually monitoring and continually checking. So in other words, it's just as susceptible to cybersecurity requirements as any other set of architecture at the end of the day. Uh, it's it's built on, a, on an architecture, it's built on code, uh, and it's uh, running around on the internet and so all of those same cybersecurity principles apply to a, to a blockchain as they do on any other network infrastructure at the end of the day, right? Absolutely. And then some, because once that data gets put into the blockchain, um, it's there. You know, you can't, there's no deleting. It's immutable. Uh, that, yep. That's kind of the point of blockchain, right? Is that, we is, have that, is, that a, is that a real risk of once, once there is a compromise, that's it. It's how, is there any coming back from that? I mean, obviously, it might be uh, the type of compromise, but let's say a smart contract is compromised and taken over. Uh, what, what's, yeah, what, what's moving forward? Can that be uh, repaired? Yeah, I mean, basically, you have loss of, of data or, or um, you know, incorrect data being put into the blockchain. Uh, going back to the financial side of the house, of course, we have loss of money real money, yep. depending on how smart contracts, you know, if the smart contract is executed twice for some reason, um, you know, with re-entrancy or something where an attacker is able to somehow inject some code. Um, so uh, there's that side of it. And then when we talk about, you know, the other side of blockchain, uh, the other uh, the other enterprises that are using it, the other, uh, you know, talking about supply chain or something else, then we, then we have, you know, data that's basically been um, tampered with, and we can't trust that data anymore. Uh, there are forks, hard forks and soft forks that happen uh, in blockchain, not very often in the financial side of the house, but sometimes you'll hear about a hard fork that happens with um, you know, Ethereum or something like that. Um, and, and that's kind of like shifting, then like kind of repairing it and then shifting it to like a new blockchain. Got it. That data is still in there. And that's a real issue that uh, we've actually talked about before with our group when it comes to privacy. Um, you know, someone gets on to a blockchain, onto a public blockchain and puts Chris's home phone number, home address. It's in the blockchain. It's there forever. Yeah. There's no way to go back and delete that. So that's, that, you know, these are the kind of risks that we talk about. So we need to make sure that, of course, the data entry that we're putting into the blockchain is not only valid and right data, but also that it's the right people or the right entity putting that data in. Okay, well, look, I'm just conscious of time as well. And what we'll do, and just for Ron, Ron's having uh, network issues and um, is only sort of capturing a little bit of what we're talking about. We'll also release this as an editor version. And we'll also release this as a podcast version or audio as well. Uh, and <laughs> it's not that Ron's choking, but uh, yeah, the network's obviously choking. Seven o'clock on the eastern seaboard of the US. So it's peak time over there uh, compared to late morning here in Australia. Um, what I'd like to finish off with, and uh, obviously the intention of this particular episode, apart from just bringing us back for 2021 with our first episode, um, was just to highlight the report, highlight the technology, uh, and we'll have a link uh, to, and I believe, I think it's open source the report, otherwise, uh, 
ISACA members will have access to it for free. Uh, and we'll have the link uh, in the show notes as well to the actual, I keep calling it a report, but it's a framework and guidance. So if you're interested in blockchain, even if you're a specialist in blockchain, uh, you'd be well versed to uh, read this report. Um, what I'd like to finish off with, Dustin, is just what's your role? You, you talk, you're a principal futurist with ISACA. Um, just pre-interview, you've been there for about four years and I, you know, we suggest you've got the best job in the world being a futurist and actually a paid futurist. That's a, that's a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people call themselves futurists, but no one's paying them to do it. Um, where, yeah, what are some of the, the key aspects of your role and where is ISACA looking as well as a, as an interested member? Um, we, we have member chapters here in Sydney and, and Malaysia as well. So for the ISACA members, I'm sure, uh, they'd be interested to know sort of what you're looking at for them. Absolutely. So uh, just to give you a little bit of background on ISACA in case you don't know who we are, um, we are an international nonprofit organization. Uh, we have, uh, I believe, over 180,000 members in 200 different countries. It's probably more than that now, but the last time I checked the stats, that's what it was. And we focus mainly on cybersecurity, governance, IT audit uh, issues. Um, we release white papers, we release studies, um, uh, we have training as well. Um, if you ever heard of the CISM certification, CISA certifications, those are two of our uh, certifications, those are two, our two biggest certifications we have, but we also have certifications for governance, uh, certifications for cybersecurity, and training for all of those things as well. Um, my job at ISACA is actually to go out and uh, uh, do the research on emerging technologies. So uh, blockchain is, is, is definitely an example of that. Quantum is definitely an example of that. Uh, we're working on some AI, uh, AI and machine learning things as well as uh, IoT. Um, you know, you name you name any kind of emerging technology, and we're looking into it for our constituency to make sure that uh, when the time comes and their uh, you know CTO comes in and is like, hey, we're going to implement uh, AI into our new system, and we're going to do the IT auditor on staff is prepared, the cybersecurity practitioner is prepared. So um, we kind of take a look at it from like the two to five to ten to twenty year. Um, kind of uh, a length of times there. So to make sure that uh, we're, we're um, you know, properly preparing all of our members uh, uh, for the future. Yeah, very good. Okay, look, and Ron, are you with us now? What's, uh, maybe we haven't heard a lot about the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance. I know you touched on it at the start, but uh, maybe some of the sort of projections for 2021 from your perspective yeah, I think, Chris, if you can hear me, I think apologies hey, for the connection issues. I'm not sure what's going on. You were asking uh, predict predictions for 2021. Uh, I am prohibited by my board from predicting Bitcoin's price, which I will never do. Um, I can tell you that when we look at it from an adoption perspective, um, every, every major presentation, uh, every major enterprise that we're working with, including some of the biggest supply chain providers, and I would argue that by the end of 2021, at a technology education level, uh, any major enterprise that hasn't dedicated a little bit of time and really learn about blockchain and the models of governance, you, you'll begin, you're falling behind if you haven't done that by the end of 2021. Nice. And that's a very good way to finish. Uh, we've been going for about 40 minutes, which is ideal uh, from our perspective. Uh, look, just stay on. What I'm going to do is just briefly, I've got a bunch of slides. I didn't know how many to do in terms of the figures, but just from the audience perspective, as we close this video, I'm just going to highlight some of the key figures. So this was the architecture uh, model. Uh, then we have the key conditions of a modern contract that it talks through. Like I said, this is about a 100 odd page uh, guidance and, and framework that you can use. Uh, then there was the typical topology for second generation blockchain network. And I'll just take that caption down one moment. Um, this was the governance models uh, introduced as well. The governance levels, uh, and uh, we talked about the application network levels as well, but also the roles, uh, just briefly, the risk management roles, vendor partners, security personnel, IT managers and practitioners, business unit managers and board of directors. So there is a governance uh, level for all of those. So obviously for large enterprise, uh, this is going to be a sort of all of business uh, approach. Uh, and then there's the, the business architecture, technical architecture is covered. 
So quite an in-depth report. Ron Quaranta, the chairman and CEO for the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance. And sorry, Ron, for the network issues, but uh, your comments, however brief, were very valuable. And Dustin Brewer, the principal futurist there in Melbourne, Florida, uh, with ISACA. So great to have you gents on. Thank you to the ISACA team for organising this, uh, both uh, here in Australia and head office. Uh, but well worth and uh, nice to kick off 2021 with blockchain. So thank you very much. I'll let you gents go and I'm just going to close off with our report of the day uh, and then we'll be back uh, on Tuesday. Thanks, uh, Dustin. Thanks, Ron. Thank Pleasure you, meeting you. Appreciate it. Good on you. I'm going to put you backstage. Just as we do the report of the day, this is uh, the Splunk 2021 predictions uh, for data security and from the Splunk CISO, Yasir Abesselham. Uh, we have to deliver the same level of security protection to employees in contingent workforce, regardless of location, office, home, or even the coffee shop hotspot. So it's a tall order, uh, but so the focus for CISOs, uh, their attention will be on the endpoint for 2021, and the specific security model will be zero trust. So if you haven't heard it already, security trust uh, will be a term you will continue to hear. Um, what's on for 2021 for us? Uh, we've already uh, sort of renewed and updated the marketplace, but that is a work in progress as we continue. Uh, we've got a couple of new websites, but all websites are getting updated. Uh, we're also renewing some re websites and expanding our products range on the marketplace uh, and uh, hope to bring more giveaways and merchandise. In fact, if you're here in Australia, you want to go to the Australian Cyber Security Magazine website or the Australian Security Magazine, you can get a chance for a home surveillance kit if that is of, of any interest, uh, but welcome to check that out. So otherwise, we're going to be back on Tuesday, Tuesday morning, Australian Eastern Standard Daylight Saving Time. So um, yeah, 10 a.m. Uh, or early in Western Standard Time, looking at the US Indo-Pacific strategy with John Blaxland and Guy Bokenstein. So looking forward to that. So thank you very much for joining us on episode one for 2021 on MySecurity TV. Absolute pleasure. And we'll see you on Tuesday. Signing off.